All right, it is going. Um, this is Connor Jehoda. Uh, we're doing this ordinary holiness interview, and we're going to start it off just by asking Connor Jehoda, who is Connor Jehoda? All righty. Well, my name is Connor Jehoda. Um, I attended Scott Catholic High School, and I just recently graduated. And I'm a Catholic. I'm a Catholic man. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Good definition, I suppose. Huh? What kind of things were you involved in at Scott? What, what kind of activities? Um, I was heavily involved in wrestling, and then. Um, I started getting really involved in my faith senior year and started doing activities that involved that. So for the majority of your high school career, um, you said like heavily involved in wrestling. That was probably like the biggest thing you did at SCUT. Um, other activities, I'm sure too. I'm sure you're involved in some other stuff there too. Obviously classes, right? You had to take some classes. But it's not yeah. till the end of your of your career at SCUT that, that faith really played a part, huh? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't until the till my senior year. Yeah. Well, walk us back a little bit on that. You know, okay, so you're this kid that goes to SCUT. How did you get to that point at SCUT where you're, you know, you're, let's talk about like you being a kid and, and what your faith looks like as a kid and how it kind of like grows and builds, especially towards your senior year. What kind of, even some like, even little milestones, I guess. Yeah. So I was, um, I was baptized when I was real little, but um, I just wasn't really involved in my faith too much when I was young. Like we'd go to church and you know, we were, me and my family really weren't too consistent with it. And um, then my mom and my dad were also split up. And my mom, she is, she's not religious at all. But my dad, he's pretty religious. But even then, we still just struggled with consistency with church and our faith lives. And then, you know, fast forward all through my elementary and middle school. Um, I was, spent my first year of high school in Lincoln with my mom. And then I moved up to um, Omaha where I started, we would attend church more regularly because I was living with my dad. And then um, sophomore year, I went to Elkhorn. And then junior year, I transferred to Scott. And then um, still didn't take my faith as seriously as I should have. It definitely heightened when I started going to Scott and took theology classes and all that. Yeah, but it was senior year retreat is when really everything changed. Okay. So like, so you would even say, so, you know, you're just kind of like, you're kind of going through the motions as a little kid, even as your first couple of years of high school, but you did notice a difference going to Scott, you know, just having the opportunities to, to talk about your faith on a regular basis, to explore different aspects of your faith. That was a noticeable difference. You would say that that was, that was important. Um, and so, and you noticed something there, you know, while it might not have been the, the total package, you might not have really like, like jumped all in, but still it was, it was a good thing, right? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Um, how about like senior retreat? Um, talk a little bit about that, you know, what, what that experience looks like and how that impacted your life. Okay. So senior retreat, we got to like pick our group of friends and my group of friends happen to be known as like the rowdy ones. <laughs> and so we actually got paired with you, Adam, because that's was your job was to go with the rowdy kids. And we just went really deep into discussion about our faiths. And you just said some things and you talked about the Eucharist and how important it was. And I just, I guess I never really, you really opened my eyes to things I never really thought about. Hmm. And then after retreat, you asked um, all of us who were at retreat if we wanted to join, um, just come and be with us every Friday over lunch and just talk about our faith. And I was the only one who said yes. And so that's where it really took off. And it's funny because when we started, you didn't even really, we didn't talk that much about faith, but as it progressed, we just kept on talking about faith. And then when we talked about the infiltration of the Vatican, that's what completely made me do a 180. Okay. So like, so really what, what it was, was like a, a continual dive into like some deeper stuff of the faith. Like you're saying like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of like drawn into some of these things that this guy's talking about, um, about the Eucharist, about confession. Cause that's the kind of the things we talk about at the retreat, right? You know, we're talking about just, I mean, you know, they're, they're basic things in the faith, but still sometimes we don't, we don't give them much credence. You know, we don't really talk about the sacraments too much. We don't really talk about prayer too much. You know, well, like, maybe it's this, we talk about them, you know, we talk about what the Eucharist is and stuff like that. Maybe not my experience with it. So maybe you were drawn in by, by like that connection, like, like coming to grips with it, your very, your very own self. Yeah. Yep. For sure. Just cool. talking about, yeah, the experiences that you had with it I and mean, just really yeah. my perspective on it. Yeah. And I guess that's an interesting point with, um, you know, just a, a, as our meeting started off, you know, we're, I remember, I remember like we spent the most of our time talking about Assassin's Creed. I think we talk about video games like every single time. Right. But then obviously our, our conversations got more serious and we started really talking about the Eucharist and, and what that means to us as Catholics and uh, in, a, in a prayer life. I remember talking about the rosary every once in a while, you know, we would, we would kind of dive into those topics, which, which might be a good shift now, you know, to talk about, you know, 
you've been involved in some of the groups at St. At St. Pat's, but also we've been involved with each other at SCUT. One of the, one of the groups that we're in, that we have at St. Pat's, we talk about the five ordinary means of holiness. And that's kind of like the thrust of this interview here to kind of talk about, okay, yeah, I see people that are devoted to Jesus Christ. That's crucial. You know, there's this, like, I think that you came to that realization, you know, okay, Jesus Christ is somebody, you know, like this is his flesh and his blood. How does that impact me as a man? Like, does that change my life? And that, that, that sent you tumbling down like this, this pathway. So when it comes to this, this, this class, or not this class, but this group, we talk about prayer, we talk about sacraments, we talk about penance, we talk about charity, and we talk about study as five kind of like disciplines that we do. Because like I said earlier, like the relationship with Jesus is important. That devotion to Jesus is important. But with every relationship or devotion, there's a there's corresponding disciplines that we have to do. There's corresponding expectations. So, okay, you have this faith in Jesus Christ that you kind of like have just kind of recently captured. Um, so let's talk about, let's start, let's take them one by one. You know, those five things I listed. When it talks about prayer, how has your prayer looked like throughout your life compared to like even recently? How has it changed? What does it look like now? Things like that. Well, okay. So when I was little, I really never prayed. Um, maybe if I had like a stomach ache, I'd pray and be like, Oh God, please make my stomach pain go away or something like that. But, um, as I started to grow up, I started to actually pray a little more. Like we've always prayed before dinner and stuff like that. But, um, I used to do a lot of just like my own prayers, just, you know, basically free verse prayers. Mm -hmm. But now that I've gotten more into my faith, I've done a lot more structured prayer, structured prayers, especially like the rosary and, um, the Catholic devotional and just readings from scriptures and all stuff like that. So yeah. more structured prayer as I've gotten more into my faith. And would you say that not only is it like, you know, you're, you're, you're praying those more rote prayers or structured prayers than just kind of like some free verse stuff. Would you say that it kind of like, it kind of became like a thing that you would do every once in a while, like throughout your day, if you thought about it to like where you're actually setting aside time during your day to do these things. Is that also how it became a little yeah. bit? Structured? That's, yeah. That's I just feel like it went hand in hand when I started doing the structured prayer, I started like structuring my day to yeah. include it. And I think that really kind of goes hand in hand with the, with the, with like a workout mentality, you know, you as a wrestler, you got to stay pretty fit. I've heard wrestling is decently difficult. So when you're, when you're, when you're someone who works out, if I asked you like, Hey Connor, do you work out? You're not going to say like, Oh, you know, I pretty much work out all the time, man. Like when I'm picking up the bags for the groceries, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm picking up my books at school, I'm working out like, no, you're going to say, yeah, bro, me and the boys get together after school and we go in there and we hit legs, dude. Some of the mm -hmm. guys don't like hitting legs, but that's because they're cowards. Like if you, if you hit legs, cause it's hard, you know, like you have certain times that you go in and you, and you do serious work. I think it's the same in the prayer life. You know, we're going to set aside time and we're going to do these things as we should. We're going to set aside time and, and do some structured, like, like even a workout, you know, Hey, we're going to do a five, three, one workout today, or we're going to hit five six, to 10 or whatever we're going to do. It's like that structured prayer where I'm going to pray a rosary right now. I'm going to pray the Angelus right now. I'm going to go through Divine Mercy Chaplet right now. Different things like that, huh? Yeah. Yep, exactly. Excellent. Well, uh, the next one, sacrament. And that kind of is kind of the thrust of, of, of kind of your conversion, especially when it comes to the Eucharist and confession. Can you, can you let us in on how that looks in your life? And again, again, like maybe a little preview of how it was when you were a kid. And then what happened as you've kind of, as you've kind of taken that deeper dive? Oh uh, yeah, when I was a kid, I mean, I didn't know anything about the sacraments. Nothing. I really didn't get deep into the sacraments until I started going to scout, like really taking them seriously, especially senior year. And yeah, the one that really like made me do a 180 in my faith was the Eucharist. Just you talked about how um, important it was. And I started just doing my own research on it. And I learned about Eucharistic miracles. And that's like, I would say the sacrament that really changed my view on everything. And um yeah, when I now take the Eucharist, I don't touch it. Um, I take it on my knees, and that's mainly because you kind of explained to me about the ordained hands, and I that's just the sacrament that really changed my faith life for sure is the Eucharist. And I know all sacraments are equally as important to each other, but the Eucharist is the one that really just, I don't know, just like the sacrament that I like most. Yeah. I mean, they do, they do call it the most blessed sacrament. So I suppose you could say that it, it's got to like, a, it's got to, I mean, every sacrament has its own thing, you know, like mm -hmm. I mean, baptism is that entry, that gateway sacrament, but the Eucharist is this most blessed sacrament. I think you, you said it great, you know, when you start to realize like what this really is and how that, and how I act in accordance with that, you know, what am I going to do when it comes up to, to presenting myself for the Eucharist? Mm -hmm. How am I going to behave? How should I behave? If this is the king of the universe, 
how should I behave when receiving the king? And I think that brings us to the next one too. And, and, and know this too. I don't know if when I do these interviews, like people aren't always like a hundred percent on everything where they're like prayer, hundred percent, Eucharist, hundred percent. You know, there are some they struggle with. So if any of these you struggle with, go ahead and just lay that out with in whatever depth you're willing to lay it out with. But the next one I think is a tough one when it comes to sacraments is confession. You know, I think that a lot of kids, you know, you probably went to scut and, and they let you go to confession, you know, on a regular basis, you know, but how does that look in your life? Cause when you do present yourself to Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, like we need to be free of mortal sin. So how does that look in your life? And, and that, and that Eucharistic relationship uh, along with confession, how has that worked out in your life? Um, yeah, man, before, um, I remember when I, um, did my first confession, I was like really scared and everything. And honestly, it's very, confession is very like humbling in my opinion. Like I'm not, afraid to go to confession or anything like that anymore but it definitely i don't know it's it's almost embarrassing sometimes just because it really humbles you yeah in front of god and yeah and yeah if i am ever in a state of mortal sin where i haven't confess gone to confession i would not receive the eucharist because i would not want to add on to those mortal sins mm -hmm. but um yeah i just i, I actually like confession a lot because it's very humbling and after you come out of it you feel that i you feel a lot better like yeah. a weight it off your shoulders so you've encountered the mercy of Jesus Christ. How, how was that? How was, you know, maybe in your past life, you know, maybe you went to your first confession, you didn't go to confession for a while again, or it's got, you know, you're just kind of going because they're offering it today. So everyone's going, so I'm just going to go. Has, have you seen an increase in your frequency of going to reconciliation at all over the last couple of months? Yeah, definitely I have. Um, it definitely got a little, not as consistent once the whole COVID stuff hit, yeah, for sure. but, um, before that hit, yeah, I was going every, I tried to go every two weeks, every two to three weeks. And there's even times where I'd go once a week. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, because I'm just, I don't know, I have big fear. I don't ever want to die in the state of mortal sin. So I always just try to get the slate cleaned. As yeah, I've heard that's a bad thing to do to die in a state of mortal sin. I think you want to die in a state of grace from what I understand. Yes. <laughs> that's a good point. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, even seeing that, that zeal, like a guy trying to root out sin out of his life as a, as a Catholic man, if you're going to be a Catholic man, you should be rooting sin out of your life. And I think that's a great example of how to get that done, you know, re regularly taking advantage of the sacrament of reconciliation. Um, you know, as uh, most people really struggle with the next one I'm going to talk about, it's, it's penance, you know, so, you know, taking on sufferings um, for the good of others, you know, or, or denying yourself temporal goods um, for your own holiness. As a wrestler, I think that all of wrestling is a penance. So maybe this one, while other people might struggle with it, I don't know if you succeed in this, but why don't you let us into just a little bit of your, of your penitential life, some of the aesthetic things that you do? Oh, well, I'm a big believer in um, fasting. That is probably the biggest form of penance. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce very well. The biggest form that I do. Um, actually, for Easter, um, I planned on doing a three-day fast, but it, it turns out um, my dad didn't want me doing that, so I just would fast sun up to sundown. Mm -hmm. I did that before Easter, and I even – practice fasting usually just on a regular day i'll i won't eat breakfast i won't eat until about two or three yeah. four afternoon and um i don't know if wrestling wrestling definitely did help condition me to do that but i now have learned to enjoy fasting and anytime um like during easter when i'd get really hungry because i wouldn't drink anything during easter either i wouldn't drink sun up to sundown either and when i would you know, start to feel myself crack or something like I wanted, because I would still work out during these times too. And um, I would just think like, you know, Jesus did it for 40 days and I can, I can do it for just 12, 12, 12 hours. Yeah. You know, sun up to sundown or probably a little bit longer than that. But so do you think like, and maybe even this would be a good, um, a good parallel, like previously in your life, when you, you know, when you were, and not that you, not that you still don't love wrestling, because I'm sure that you do, you know, as much as anybody can love wrestling, because I, I mean, it's brutal, dude, as a former wrestler, but when you were in wrestling, it was something that you probably did to lose weight, to stay in shape, um, but it seems like it's transitioned into more of a thing, as you referenced, like, I'm trying to conform myself to Christ now, you know, I see Jesus Christ taking up his cross, and therefore, in an effort to conform myself in that same line, I'm going to do as he commands, just take up my cross every day and offer up this suffering as well. Is that kind of how it's gone down? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And also there is health benefits to fasting too, but yeah, I just, I feel like it's one of the greatest forms of suffering because you just see nowadays people eat three meals a day, solid, always eat breakfast. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like back then, even the apostles, they're just all the saints. They were big into fasting. That was a big thing they were into. So I'm like, why can't I do 
can do it. I mean, I'm pretty, yeah. I guess, I don't know if you'd be good at it, but I can, I can do it often. So, yeah. And that's not always, you know, it's not always true for everybody. Some people really struggle with fasting. So I, I think that you bring up a good point. It's something that you found success at. So it's an aspect of this, of these ordinary means of holiness. This one of these things that you find yourself to be good at. So therefore you maybe do it more frequently than other people do it because you are successful at it. You know, it's something that you can really grab onto. And it's a, it's a way that God has allowed for you to really become holy. Yes, exactly. Awesome. Well, here's another one then, you know, these kind of go hand in hand. When you deny yourself, you know, in the Christian life, we're called to deny ourselves and to turn outward and look at other people, to care about other people. When we talk about charity, we're talking about loving God for his own sake, loving our neighbors as ourselves. And oftentimes I talk with the students, not always about like, and, and this, you can bring these in, but like, you know, we got like Skyhawks in the city, right? They're always about doing good charitable works, you know, going and helping those that are disadvantaged. You can bring up things like that. I don't, I don't think you were involved in that, but that's an example of something that someone might be involved in. But also just in your very own home, you know, I think that we talked about some really awesome things that you were involved in over the over that COVID break at the end of the school year with your brother and things like that. Just being just being a good son, being a good brother, being obedient to your parents, being a being a good older brother. What kind of ways do you find yourself loving other people and loving God for his own sake? Um, yeah, when I get to visit my little brother, I don't get to see him as often. So I just try to, you know, I just try to hang out with him because. Um, I don't know. He used to always grow up with me and I used to be around him all the time and now I'm not. And I feel like, you know, if I had an older brother, I always just look at my friends who have older brothers. I always look at them as so cool. So I'm just like, he probably looks at me the same way. So mm -hmm. I always just try to hang out with him and do as much as I can with him and kind of try to guide him because it's hard for him because both his parents aren't, you know, very spiritual at all. So I try to maybe rub that off on him a little bit, but I don't try to push that too hard on him. Sure. We're just trying to be like that, just like a soft pressure, right? Where you're, where you're there, you're a, you're a good motivator in his life. You're not overbearing, but you're just kind of providing that slight pressure to him as a good example, huh? Yeah. Yeah. He just, he's a good kid though. Real good yeah. kid. You know, honestly, I think that was one of the greatest things that I heard over the break, you know, just hearing you going to Lincoln, taking that time that you might not get to spend with him. You're going to Lincoln, you're spending that time and you're, you're just being a good brother. You know, you're like, Hey, like, I think you say like, you guys went out and climbed trees and stuff like, Hey, let's just go climb a tree. You know, let's go out in the forest and just get dirty, you know, which I think is, it's part of that relationship building, you know, like you have to have those good relationships with those people that in your life, especially the ones that it can sometimes be most difficult to love. You know, when it comes to our family, they, they can be so hard to love because we're always around them all the time. But those are the ones that God calls us to love the most. Yep, exactly. Um, how about this one? Um, and I think, and you kind of talked to it earlier as well, this study aspect, you know, studying our faith, growing in knowledge of, of the Christian faith. I think so many, so many people, old and young, they leave their faith in eighth grade. You know, you, you have to go to these classes, or if you go to Scott, you know, you have to go to theology class. But I think some people like leave that, they leave their faith in 12th grade. They leave their faith in eighth grade and they don't, they don't do it on their own. They don't, they don't, they don't, it doesn't go anywhere. You know, it's just so, it can be so so regimented where it's like I'm taking this class because I have to almost like reading books like if I would be like hey Connor do you read books or like ah, I read books in class and I don't have got time to read books you know I don't have I don't have time to read for enjoyment I think the same thing goes in the faith you know there's there's certain things we have to know in the faith but there's also that that research and that study for enjoyment and you kind of brought it up earlier can you kind of let us in on that as well um yeah I think the biggest tool that we really have an advantage um nowadays in this modern age is the internet because I think a lot of people think, oh, if I want to go study, you know, theology, I have to go get a theology book or read the Bible all the time. And I, I just don't think that's true. I mean, you can go on a YouTube video and you can learn so much. I feel like some of the most valuable information is on YouTube and yeah. especially for the faith. I've watched many videos there and I've learned so much. And I just feel like the internet is the biggest tool nowadays. And so you can just be informed on, you literally can learn whatever you want through right. what that's faith or not so and you even mentioned it you know some of these you know you're like a, a key point for you was the eucharist and coming to that realization and then you start then you start tumbling down that idea of like man eucharistic miracles whoa what's this you know just all these crazy things that would blow people's minds about the eucharist um can you tell us about maybe some of those videos that you watched about that oh, yeah i remember i watched this one it was about um i can't remember exactly it was somewhere in um latin america and um a priest found um after the service he found a um he found a eucharist um piece of bread on the ground and um so he put it in the tabernacle for it to uh you know dissolve in water but he came back the next day 
to open and see if it dissolved. And it was a piece of flesh with blood Mm -hmm. and that flesh was actually tested. And, um, they couldn't find any matching DNA from anyone in their database of it. And it was almost like this uh, DNA was, it was human, but it was like, I don't know how to explain it. They, they explained it a lot better than I did. Um, I watched it a while back, but it was, it was, but even then I'm sure that even they were like, we don't know how to explain this, right? Yeah, you know, it, like, it, was like human, it was human flesh from like, and it was aged like 2,000 years. Interesting. Yeah. You just get these crazy scientific realities from this like seemingly piece of bread that's on the ground that all of a sudden turned into this flesh. And I think that a lot of people would be shocked by that. You know, some of those crazy things like, um, like incorruptible bodies, you know, these saints that have died and their bodies are still laying there like Padre Pio. They're still laying in there like they were 60 years ago, like they haven't decomposed. And folks are like, what's up with that? You know, like these amazing things that people don't even really consider. But yeah. the internet's full of full of stories about those YouTube videos, yeah. all kinds of stuff. Thousands of videos, yeah. Yeah. Well, here's my last question for you then, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, I think it's a, it's a struggle. The reason I put these videos out is I, I like to, to, to have parents. We put it on the face page. I don't know if you, you ever heard of the face page? You, uh, you know about YouTube, but the Facebooks, you know what that is? I'm sure you yeah. don't have an account. But, you know, there's lots of parents on Facebook, and, and I think there's a lot of parents that are struggling out there. You know, you think of the, like a Scott parent, you know. Not everybody, that, not, not all the kids at Scott are diehard Catholics, you know. That's just, I mean, it doesn't yeah. matter what school you go to, but there's parents out there that want their students to, to really grab on to the faith and take a bite out of it, you know, and just take it for their own, you know. If you, could, if you could give, like, some encouragement to parents on some ways that you have seen, like, your own parents acting in your life in the positive way as far as encouraging you in the faith, or if you've seen other examples from your friends or whoever that have been negative, maybe like one positive and one negative for parents to, to chew on. Okay. Well, I think one of the best things a parent can do just from, in my opinion, is put them, and I actually never had this, but put them in a youth group because early on, I feel like that would get them involved and make friends through faith and it would actually make them want to go to events because their friends are there and then they get to learn about the Catholic faith instead of just making, you know, just going with their family. Cause mm-hmm. you know, kids don't like to listen to their parents really. What? It's just, just kind of how it is. And yeah. I think that's one of the best things or just find them, find them someone kind of like you, Adam, this was you to me, just find them someone that really um, is their like spiritual advisor, just really connects with them and can makes it fun to learn about faith. Mm-hmm. And just so they're not dreading it. So I would say youth group or find them a spiritual advisor that just really relates to them. So like a, like a good community, right? Whether it be their peers, whether it be, and I think we have all these things in life too. Like, I mean, the youth groups are out there for sure, but you even think about like a confirmation sponsor, you know, you, you would, you would encourage parents to help this person pick somebody who's a confirmation sponsor. That's going to continue to challenge them. Right. You know, like if, if there's that person in life that's, that's asking them like, Hey, how's the prayer life going, man? Like, do you have any questions about the faith? You know, someone that they can really lean on in times of, of trial or, or even in times of joy, you know, someone they can talk to. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Just somebody that they're, they're close with. Yeah. Yeah. How about a, how about any, how about any negatives? Can you be, let's end this on it. Let's end this on a down note. Anything that you can see, and it doesn't have to be on your, in your own life, um, but just but anything you've seen that, that you've seen that particularly sticks out where it's like, yeah, don't do this. Um, gosh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, man, I'm trying to think, uh, man, I know people aren't going to like this, but don't, don't force your kids to go to like, I just don't force your kids to go and eat go to anything because what I've just this is just from my friends like some of my friends who like aren't really faithful at all and they always just their families were always the most overbearing on them were mm-hmm. always the most, like, you got to go to all the events all this mm-hmm. all that every single faith event you have to go to that and as much as I would not like to just see someone skip that and um and I'm a big believer in discipline you know you don't you know you don't let your kids do whatever they want or anything like that but right. I, that's just from what my personal experience I've noticed when kid when people really become involved out of their faith it's either they had no faith life growing up or they had a super intense one okay i just say keep it keep it somewhere in the middle so stay away from those uh those extremes you know where you're making them go to all the things or none of the things but like picking your battles in the middle i think that's common parent language parent language right you know hey pick if your kids are rebelling you know back off a little bit pick the battles you know find it, kind of make it their make it their decision okay hey choose between these ones which one would you like to go to different things like that. Give them a stake in it. Maybe. Yeah. I just look at it this way. If you force them to go to it and they don't want to go to it, it's not going to like, they're not going to like it anymore. Yeah. The next, it's going to make them almost just 
hate it. And, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Especially in the faith life. Like, there's some things, yeah, you have to definitely go to. And I agree everyone should go to Sunday Mass. But right. just, yeah. Just don't, awesome. just don't be overbearing, I guess, would be my advice. But don't be underbearing either. So don't just. Be just the right bearing. Just yeah. be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. That's all. That's all. That's all Connor's going to recommend today. Yeah. But you bring That's up a good point. Good one. Well, awesome, man. I appreciate it. And um, we'll get this sucker out there and we'll see, uh, we'll see how it goes. Maybe we'll get a lot of likes on it or something. Yes, we, I hope so. Thank you. Awesome, yeah. Connor. I appreciate it. God bless, brother. Yeah, God bless. All right.